Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. This interview is pretty long, so I'm going to keep the intro short. Ken Cunningham is an awesome guy. He's got an impressive day job, and he still kicks all the ass in the art world at, at, at nighttime. He's like some sort of artist Batman who's bringing justice via art to the dark times we live in. Um, so we go through all of these things in the description. I'm going to put a more thorough bio. The guy is incredible. I was thrilled to talk to him as I was with Sophie and Jan. Everybody involved with this book is great. The book looks stunning. I hope you've had a chance to check it out from Suntup Editions. And if you are a purchaser, I hope um, I hope you get a, a kick out of these interviews because uh, for me, they really do add a level of affection for these books once they're on our shelves. So check out the interview. Um, check out Ken Cunningham's art and um, stay frosty. Once I'm not talking to myself, it's time to go beyond the book and get over your shell. So thank you for joining me today, uh, Ken, and um, uh, I'm really excited to talk to you. This is a really important book, um, Handmaid's Tale, and I think it's captivated a lot of people recently because of the, the TV show. I, for one, was shocked to discover that this was written in 85 uh, because, again, that that um, HBO series, was it HBO? I don't know. But the uh, Hulu. Series, Hulu, Hulu yeah. yeah. It came to light and I think got a lot of people jazzed about it. And so I just thought it was a, a recent phenomenon. And I think I liked it even more after I heard it was from 85. So, um um, so I'm, I'm glad to talk to you about this, but before we get into this book, I got to ask, um, when did you know you were an artist or, or better yet, when did you know you can make a living as an artist? Uh, oh God. I mean, like I've always drawn, like, that's just, I've always been, I guess I've always been an artist, like just depends on sort of what level and what kind of venue you're talking about. I mean, I've had kind of a weird path actually, um. I'm not weird, but I've just, I've done a lot of stuff. Um, I mean, I started out, I think like when I first started thinking about it as like a career, I was probably like 11. You know, at, at that point I was like, oh, I want to do comics. And I was, you know, doing conventions and stuff. I mean, maybe 11, uh, I think that's when I realized. And probably by the time I think I did my first sort of con was maybe like I was 12 or 13 or something. And I was selling at a table and John Byrne was just down the way from me and he did a drawing for me. And um, you, and you had a, probably, you had a table at a convention at 12. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I like, you know, I wasn't selling a lot, but yeah, I did like it. And it was like a small con in Edmonton, like where I was growing up in Canada. Wait, Edmonton, that's in uh, Oklahoma. Uh, no, Alberta, Canada. Oh, okay. Okay. And John Byrne, was from Calgary, which was another city in the same province. So he was sort of up there and him and Terry Austin, I think were there. And he was my hero at the time. Like I was just like, Oh, you know. So um, what were you, what were you selling? Prints? Just like I was, no, I was doing like drawings for people and stuff. And Oh, that's so um, cool. Yeah. Like just sort of live drawing stuff. And, and then I, then I think I sold my first kind of like piece of art in an auction when I was 14 at a science fiction convention. And then I got kind of, and then I, you know, and then I, it changed. I was like, oh, I want to be Andrew Wyeth when, when I'm 16 or whatever. And I was like, and then I discovered dance. Um, you discovered what? Dance. Dance. Uh, yeah. So then I ended up doing this sort of major right turn and I ended up becoming a professional dancer. Wow. I started off in ballet and then I ended up sort of doing contemporary work. Um and I did that till I was about 30. I retired when I was 30. Wow, that's from, amazing. From and then from there, I moved into animation. Like I, I, you know, I'd been a, like, you know, being a, I was a dancer, you're kind of a starving artist. And I was like, I'm going to go make some money now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I've been in animation, you know, uh, for a long time now. I uh, have ended up being a director. So I direct uh, series and one-off specials, like my latest round of stuff for 
is sort of like uh, the Lego Star Wars holiday special and Terrifying Tales for Disney Plus or like the last couple of projects I worked on. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I, that's I do so work cool. for Lucasfilm and Marvel and Universal. And wow. So how do you feel? How do you feel as an artist doing that? Like, um, do you feel like you can still create? I, I mean, it's such a different thing, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's, um, I mean, that's partly why I'm like, so I, that's my day job. <laughs> right. And then Pretty at, big night, day I, job. at night I, I paint, right. Um, and I've been kind of doing the painting thing for a while and sort of developing a following and kind of trying to develop, you know, a bit of a gallery uh, path. Um, and I, I guess it all came about, you know, I was starting to do sort of higher end projects and I was starting to work with some really talented kick-ass designers like when I started directing I stopped drawing like I mean obviously when I started in animation it's art based and you're drawing stuff but as I kind of moved up the chain of uh you know supervising and animation directing and then directing uh I stopped stopped drawing because you don't you, that's not what the job is the job mm -hmm. is to make notes on other people's work basically um and uh but I started working you know on higher end projects and so i was working with these really you know killer designers and stuff and i was like damn it i better get my game up like so it sort of inspired me to get back into art making yeah um, and then through that i sort of started to you know think about well what do i what sort of work do i want to be doing you know instead of like i started just doing animation based design concept based design stuff but then it was sort of like well what do I want to do with this? You know, and, and that started to move me further and further away from animation. And I started to go through this process of sort of stripping out uh, all the stuff that animation had kind of, you know, there's sort of hallmarks of animation design. And, uh, and I started stripping all that stuff away and trying to figure out what my work was and went through a number of uh, mentorships with different artists wow. and uh, studying and stuff. And, sort of ended up in this place where you know I'm putting my stuff on Instagram and getting a few gallery showings here and there and, and then I guess um, you know Rebecca saw my work um, and I got on their list of people to kind of watch for potential projects and so have you done have you done uh books before mm -hmm. no so this year your so yeah, this is my first yeah and I don't I mean it was interesting like when she uh, I think it was her that reached out first. Uh, when they when they reached out, whoever reached out, I think it was Rebecca. Um, you know, did she just show up in your studio one day? Like, <laughs> was it like because she's a ninja? So I didn't know if like <laughs> she was sitting there in the back with her, you know the executive yeah, like, thing going on. What, what's going on? Um, yeah, no, I got this email like last. Uh, I don't quite remember the timeline. Maybe February, March. Um, you know, asking me if I'd be interested in doing Handmaid's Tale. And I kind of like, it, yeah, it was kind of a, like, I was like, oh my, you know, cause I'm, so I'm Canadian. Uh, so for us, Margaret Atwood is, you know, like a cultural icon really. Yeah. Um, you know, and I've like that book has been, I, I'm a huge science fiction fan, like reading fan. Um, mm -hmm. My father had a huge collection. So I grew up reading, you know, Arthur C. Clarke and, you know, like, uh, and that book uh, was in the house, you know, my, my stepmom was a feminist and, you know, he fought, you know, like, so it was, right. it, it was kind of always there and I was aware of it, and it like on some levels as a, a teenager in the eighties, it shaped my political views on some levels. Um, I, I could see that. So you read it back in the eighties or? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean it. Yeah, it was. I mean, hard for me to read that as a. I can't remember exactly how old I was, but you know, like I was sort of fourteen, fifteen, mm -hmm. 16, something like that when I read it. Um, yeah, so it was just like really, really, really powerful. Um, so when I got this email, you know, I was just like, oh my god, you know. But I don't consider myself an illustrator, and I, uh, huh. you know, so I was like, at first, I was like, oh, you know, I don't, and I was really busy um with my day job directing sure um so it's like oh I don't you know wow like I don't know if I could take this on and then my wife was like are you kidding and then yeah uh and then she like I was sort of going back and forth with Rebecca and she sort of dropped you know I was like kind of being fanboyish about Atwood like and, yeah um, yeah 
and she uh, kind of dropped the fact that I guess she gave a short list to Atwood, or they gave a short list to Atwood, and she picked me from the short list. So then wow. I was like, okay, well, I've got to do it because that's never going to happen. Again. You were dubbed. I mean, the, the <clears throat> queen tapped your shoulder and said, "Yeah, it was just sort of like it was like, oh my god, okay, I have to, yeah, you know, I have to do it, like." you know because it's margaret atwood for god's sake well i was gonna ask how did you feel as a man illustrating that book i mean it's uh i mean i mean there's always like this is a thing like because i all my work it, like i paint women like that's my work is centered around the female image and yeah i and i try and be extremely sensitive of, like i i i think about that a lot i have a daughter yes. you know like it's and it's a choice I've made. Like I, I purposely don't paint men because they don't emotionally fit within the context that I'm trying to create with my work. Mm -hmm. um, so there is, I, I mean, I don't know that I would call my work feminist per se, but it's, um, you know, A, as a man, I find it, I don't want to kind of take on that mantle. Like, I don't think it's, you know, there's appropriation and stuff that you Exa get. Well, that's exactly what my question um, was. Yeah. yeah. And so like, yeah, the, that kind of thought process was circling around in my head and yet at yeah. the same time you know i uh i mean i'm a storyteller and i mm -hmm. you know like um and i'm sensitive uh to that point of view and well and if so margaret it, yeah. atwood if margaret atwood picked you herself yeah um, i didn't i yeah. didn't ultimately i didn't you know like definitely it was something that's always in the back of my head but mm -hmm. ultimately i didn't feel that it was problematic doing it as a man so you in were fact i think like you know, I, I, I think it's important that men try and put themselves in that point of view. Oh, oh for sure. Yeah, no, for sure. I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's something you, you have to be aware of. You have to understand that. Um, and, and, I, and from the work I've seen of, of your stuff, if we were to strip away names and, and all that, I would say your work isn't the typical male gaze it isn't the typical yeah, I, thing yeah, i try to be extremely aware of that i right. mean i'm you know i'm still i'm you know i'm trying to have my work have a certain aesthetic and beauty mm -hmm. to it but i'm not trying to like i'm not trying to have the like the woman as an object be that beauty um, right i'm trying right. to get it i'm trying to get it at a, like the like to me like i like i see a, an emotional level underneath that uh and i'm trying to paint that and, and there's a certain amount of like, I try and, you know, I use a lot of randomness in my mark making and stuff. So I'm, uh, you know, trying to generate these textures like that almost be like the technical, uh, uh, this is like to quote Vincent Desiderio, but like the technical narrative of my work almost becomes more important than the subject on some levels mm. um, in, in the textures and stuff that I'm trying to generate and play with and stuff. So when you when you were approached and then you found out you were on the short list and that Margaret Atwood picked you and then you're like I'm I'm full go ahead on this um it, did you you know so you have you've read the book <clears throat> previously was it fresh in your mind did you say I'm, I'm I want to tackle this scene and this scene did you have no a I had to it had been it had been a long yeah. time since I'd read it um so I had to you know the first thing I mean I didn't reread it before i made up my mind like it was as soon as i heard you know the short list thing I was yeah like, yeah yeah okay i'm in because this is like karma that's never going to happen again right um so you know i've got to got to do this like as a canadian <laughs> got to do my civic duty <laughs> yeah. um, serve national service yeah exactly yeah uh, and um so then i you know the first thing i did is i sat down and because they you know uh, so then I started to, again, I mean, I like uh, working in animation, I kind of understand production and, you know, like, so it, like, I, uh, none of it was a surprise to me, but it, you know, it was sort of like, okay, how's this process going to work? And, you know, do I pick the moments? Do you pick the moment, you know, like sort of right. discussing that stuff. And they were basically said, you know, like pick what you want to pick. And then if we're cool with it, you know, we'll, that's what we'll do. And, you know, so then the next thing I did was sit down, go through the book and just mark off. I don't, do I have my copy around anymore? Uh, oh, people would love to see that. If you do, they would um, love that. <laughs> I'm not sure where it is. I'm not seeing it on my shelf over here. That's so fine. Be out in the... Anyways, you know, I've got like, I went through and I just like stickied up like a bunch of yeah. stuff and notes and um, 
it picked a whole bunch of moments that I was like that really resonated with me and then sort of tried to pare it down and trying to look at it from a point of view of you know they wanted a, a relatively even spread through the book um sure then, right right and then I sort of sent in some moments and they were like yeah these are all great although we'd love to because I ended up like just focusing on uh of red so then they were like could we get an auntie and could we get mm -hmm. you know serena joy and that's sort of, okay you know and then, so we we jigged two of them i think um yeah and then then i just started to work so um yeah i mean it did you did you see the series the tv series at all i mean no i mean i was aware of it and it's sort of been on my list of stuff to watch but you know i mean uh having a young daughter and like a lot of my tv time is basically family tv time these days sure no i um, hear you you know so like watching yeah. <laughs> it still is not gonna happen for right right i mean yeah. uh, i i do try and watch stuff of my own but it's just again like you know, I'm doing this thing where I do my day job nine to five and then I paint at night and, you know, like, so there's sort of a limit. I have, I don't get to everything I want to watch. Um, and then, you know, when the, when I accepted the commission, um, you know, I purposely made a choice not to necessarily look at that material. Like I didn't want it to influence me too much. I mean, I did, um, I mean, weirdly enough, I was very influenced by, there's, um, music's a kind of a big part of my process right i mean i just listen to music a lot and it like and i i tend to i guess listen to stuff that fits within the headspace i want to be in when i'm working um and while i was working on handmaid's tale i was listening to a lot of max richter uh like a lot of contemporary classical stuff mm. and uh he did this music video with elizabeth moss to one of his pieces um and that video, I mean, it's not The Handmaid's Tale, it's just her, but her performance in that really influenced kind of a lot of the, the emotional vibe I was going through. It just gave me a, you know, again, I wasn't, you know, I was trying to create my own over it, but um, yeah, that definitely was an influence, like indirectly. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I hear you because um, as somebody trying to capture the visuals of the book because this is the book and yeah. I, I i'm someone who i don't like to if i'm gonna if i'm gonna see a movie i'd like to read the book first but then if i end up seeing the movie i don't want to read the book because then i feel like those images are crammed in my head without my choice so i usually don't like to mix it up and right. yeah, um, yeah. you know i mean you had you had plenty of visual I, yeah, you had plenty of visual cues with just the book. There's so much yeah. imagery. Oh yeah, work no, absolutely. Yeah, the, like and that like she really consciously uses color. And I know like after sort of after I'd finished, then I sort of went and looked at some just out of curiosity, went and looked at some of the production design stuff and read some stuff. You know, and they they changed in the series. They changed the color design a little bit in terms of things. And so I I you know, really wanted to stick to the book, and it was sort of. Uh, it was interesting because I mean a lot of my work like my work is it's not monochromatic but it's quite monocolored like I, I don't tend mm -hmm. to use a lot of color I use very neutral colors and I and I mean in fact like I use a lot of gray typically but you know in that was kind of a thing that came up for me early on that I wanted to kind of touch base with Paul and Rebecca about because I was reading the book and I was like hey like red and blue really figure prominently this uh and i want to do this i know like it's different than the work you've probably picked me for oh uh, right so, right you no know, so i i wanted to sort of bring that up and you know i did a <clears throat> a painting that had actually ended up being like in the book like the on the inside cover or the the front page i think um just as kind of a test like hey this is kind of the the vibe i want to go for what do you think and they were like yeah cool and um so do you feel like you had a lot of creative freedom to do yeah no it? like like a, a ton like it was great i mean because i'm used to like i mean in animation <laughs> particularly with like the clients right. i work for like lucasfilm and stuff like right we, we like it's a super iterative process right like 
um, you were just constantly noting and noting and noting. You know, so yeah. like this to me was like, oh, this is amazing. Like, you know, it, the, you know, like the notes were super minimal and um, yeah, just, it was great. Like basically they're just letting me do my thing. And, you know, and uh, cause I, I used to work in a marketing firm and, you know, I, I, as a creative writer in a marketing firm, and then I had to work with the account team who then had to work with the client. I, I know about the notes and about how, and I, I used to say this all the time um, to the account team, because, you know, we were chummy and I would tell them, well, we're doing our best and then they're going to get the rest because the first jab at it is usually where all your heart is and all your, and, and yes, you can tweak and make it a little better. But, but when you hand that first one in, that's the best anybody's going to get from you probably. So to note it to death is to just get, get something, but yeah. And I've heard that from other auth, uh, artists as well, that Sun Tup gives a lot of creative freedom. And I, I think yeah, people, no. they respect that. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that was, I, th I mean, again, I'm, you know, having to kind of remember back to last year. Um, but I mean, that was kind of one of the, I mean, I didn't explicitly say it, but I just asked some questions to kind of give me an indication of like what the process was going to be like, like, or do they note a lot? Like it, you know, like how heavy will the art direction be, you know, again, mm -hmm. being, cause I mean, I guess like I, it, you know, again, I don't consider myself an illustrator per se. I I'm doing this uh you know as a, a self-expression and to keep myself sane you know i do very commercial <laughs> work during the day and you right. know, i mean and I, and I love the work i do like you know like right uh, right at the same time you know like i'm doing um you know as a when you work in north america in the animation industry you know that that connotates certain things like the market uh you know is for children mm -hmm. um, you know and there's a part of me that you know, I, I love like science fiction. I love horror. Like I, you know, and mm -hmm. I love, you know, like, I mean, if I'd made some different choices in my life, like maybe I would have preferred to end up in live action, you know, but um, doing, you know, heavier, more serious work. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time though, I mean, that like that's a, in my directing career, like I was starting to sort of try and, you know, maybe move in that direction, but you know, it was sort of later in life, I had a mortgage and a child. And, <laughs> and, and it's harder to make that kind of, like, yeah. Yeah. you know, at that point. And I, so I sort of went and started to work towards that. And then I just kind of bailed because it was like, you know, like, this is a solid paycheck. I'm getting, you know, I'm getting mm -hmm. work on stuff that's fun. And I mean, also like, you know, um, yeah, it was just, uh, so this for me is sort of like a way of exercising that other side of me but yep. i don't have to deal with a crew or a budget or you right. know, like because there's you know like when you know i'm typically working with you know hundreds of people on my directing or like when i'm directing a project and i just don't want to deal with any of that like mm -hmm. with, i just want to create images that are me and personal so um, it's it's so, a meditative space i mean yeah and so it it but it's also like for me it's not driven by uh monetary concern or mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. certain career goals like I'm just yeah. trying to like I'm just trying to find the work <clears throat> like, and by work I mean not like work I'm being paid for but the work right. like what the work looks like what it is so do you do you see a transition from your directing job your directing career to gallery exhibits yeah maybe I mean if it pans out but again I'm not trying to put that pressure on it I'm still in this place yeah. where I'm you know I'm searching for the work um I think it's if, a, you know, I mean, go ahead well and if like if that leads to a space where I yeah I can do that great but I'm not necessarily right now anyways like I mean I you know yes like if if suddenly I was you know in a gallery and I was making enough or, or like you know like doing getting the solo thing in a high enough in gallery that it was you know not i don't expect it would ever replace my directing rate but right you know if i was making a comfortable amount of money like yeah i probably would do it but right now again i'm just it's for me it's um i'm not trying to put that pressure on it i'm just really trying to make it about the work yeah 
Yeah, and that, no, and I that's think what that, was great about working with Suntop. It was just about the work. It seemed like they were just interested in what I was doing, um, and so it was. That was just a great process. Had you heard of Suntop before this opportunity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd been like, because I'm my. I guess my art path on some levels took me through illustration to some extent, or you know, like it was sort of a natural jumping point from animation to kind of like being interested mm. in illustration based stuff. And I've studied with some people who've been sort of illustration teachers and, um, or have been illustrators. And, you know, so like, I was aware of like the, the niche press, uh, you know, like this sort of, it seems like, I mean, I don't, I haven't really talked to anybody who's working in the industry, but it sort of seems like, you know, in the, in the shift from books to digital, you know, there's been this space to create these higher end beautiful art objects basically is what, mm -hmm. you know, is what Suntop seems to be creating and a few other people seem to be creating. And um, yeah, so I was sort of aware of, of that, yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, when Suntop came on the scene, it was kind of a, a little earthquake in the small press world because there are these fine presses that have operated for hundreds of years you know they're i don't know if they go back hundreds of years but they had the old school sort of the almost almost pr presses that almost didn't care about what book they did but just how they did it and the art right. and the binding and when sun tub came along um they brought the fine press aspect to popular fiction for the day and i think that combination was i don't think that was really uh, captured to the same extent that Suntup captured it. And um, yeah. so it's been a lot. And I think now I've seen a lot more uh, fine press publishers come along to do more popular works and, you know, kind of take that up. So um, what would be a book that if you could illustrate a, a new book and you could pick whatever book you wanted to do, what would it be? Oh my God. Um, I mean, there's a lot. So you said you like science fiction. Yeah. I mean, I love science fiction. Uh, although probably the thing that first comes to mind is, uh, Italo Calavina's Baron in the Trees. Um, mm. I've just always loved that book, but then, you know, I guess like more recent stuff. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Tchaikovsky, uh, Tarkovsky's, uh, oh God, what's the book called? It's been a couple of years since I read it. Um, Millennia's Children, mm. I think is the name of the book. I, I, like it sort of blew my mind. It, like it's just this amazing uh, story about essentially cultural memory. Um, Have you read Blind Sight by Peter Watts? Yes, that actually that would be it. And this like, the, it's sort of, in, this book is sort of in the same, I love, I, I went on a big binge on him about three or four years ago when I discovered his stuff. Mm. Uh, yeah, Blind Sight's great too. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And, and like the, I mean, a couple of his other books too, within like there's sort of that was a bit of a stream. Like there's a couple of books within that or short stories and books within that kind of little universe he created. But then there's also Starfish, which was also really amazing. Um, yeah, I've only read uh, Blind Sight and uh, I have Echo Proxia, but I haven't read it yet. Um, you, should read, you should read Starfish and like the subs, there's a couple of books that follow up from that as well. It's also really cool. It's a little bit more near future. Okay. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, his stuff is really great. Yeah, he's Canadian too. So he's, yeah, yeah, yeah he's, <laughs> he's approved for you to uh, work on. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we could get a grant or something. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I, it, it's, uh, has, has Margaret Atwood seen your work? I don't know, actually. I mean, I didn't have any contact with her. I mean, she'd, she obviously saw, like, you know, with in the approval process, she must have seen my website or something, like, when she was yeah. from the shortlist. But I, I don't know that she's seen the, the pieces for the, the project. Yeah. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't really know. I, I had no um, communication with her, and I didn't really kind of push it. I mean, I think I asked Rebecca to pass on my fanboyishness at the beginning. <laughs> kind of, uh, but after that, it was basically just about sort of communicating with Rebecca and Paul. Yeah, you know, um, I, I do know that 
Paul had a hard time landing this book. He tried to get rights to this book and it didn't come through. And then it came through finally. So I don't know what the relationship was. Uh, you know, I don't know where the speed bump was. Was it Margaret Atwood saying, I don't want a fine press edition or was it her man? I don't know. Yeah. And, I have no idea. Yeah. But I mean, I, I'd imagine when you get into like, I mean, you know, she's pretty big status. Yeah. And I'd imagine when you're dealing with any author at that kind of level, like that there's a lot of hoops to jump through. Mm -hmm. Have you read any of other hers? Have you read any other Margaret Atwood books? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, mostly, I mean, I, I know she tends to try and avoid the, 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 the genre name, like science fiction, but I guess her more speculative fiction on X and crack and, you know, like some, oh, okay. other, you know, uh, some of those others. Yeah. Yeah, no, the first time I picked this book up was was for this release. When Suntup announced it, I was dismissive. I thought, is that that TV series about the Renaissance Fair? Like, I had no idea what it was. Right, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I'm like, well, I'll read it. And so I was really lukewarm about it. But then after reading it, I, I'm like, wow, this, this, it's a shame because I think uh, the story gets pulled by people who want it to mean a certain thing and mean another thing. And, and we, you lose sight of the, the overall warning. And, um, and that, that's the other thing I was going to ask, do you feel like any of the COVID pandemic, any of uh, what the whole world's going through now, do you feel, did that affect any of your work? Cause, cause it's an interesting dynamic because it feels yeah. like all of a sudden we're very aware of the institutions around us more so than in prosperous carefree times, you don't even think about really the government and then all of a sudden. Yeah, maybe, I mean, like, I guess for me, like it resonates more as a, you know, as a Canadian watching what was going on with Trump. Mm. Um, and then all, some of that politics sort of, I mean, our politics are not as extreme, but um, yeah, you can see, but you can see some of that coming into the conservative movement up here and uh, you know, like that, that for me was kind of more the prescience of it. But yeah, it's been interesting too with, you know, the pandemic and it, just how that's heightened that whole thing. Like, so you had Trump happen, you know, and then the pandemic and that sort of like all that, all that division that was already happening is like just gotten heightened and put into other places. And, you know, the whole vax versus anti-vax and, you know, it's just like. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, no. And it's, it's definitely um, sort of a, ripe environment for a lot of uncertainty and yeah. i think you know even here in chicago with with we have uh the teachers aren't going back to school and i mean just there's there's so many of these little culture quakes social sort of uh ripples um that for me i don't know i i don't know what it was but when i was reading the book and when i thought about the pandemic all of a sudden we are very connected in, in ways you could really feel the spider web in, in some ways. Um, but I was, I was just curious because I know a lot of uh, artists and authors I've talked to have felt their art, their expression has been flavored by sort of this um, claustrophobia. Right, I mean, uh, I mean, it's funny, like, I mean, on some levels, like, I mean, you know, so we, we shifted production to working from home, like, within you know, March of 2020 or whatever. Mm -hmm. and I've been, this is the way I direct now, like with Zoom and, you know, like we just do meetings. And um, I gotta say, I actually, it, for me, it suits me. Like, I mean, yeah. I've always been, you know, like as, you know, like a director, you're kind of like the creative head of production. So there's a certain element of like, just getting the team moving and rah, 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 let's go. Like it's mm -hmm. to get the work to where you want the work to go to. and I mean, I'm a, I'm an extremely introverted person. And so in order to, in order to do that job, like I had to grow into that ability or like learn to, you know, kind of uh, perform to a certain extent uh, that, but there's always a, you know, um, yeah, it was great. Cause like this, I, I could control access more. Um, yeah. Than yep. I could at the studio, like at this, like there's, when you're directing, there's the work you, you have to do and then there's just the answering questions part of your job and right um 
So there's work I actually have to get through making notes or reviewing stuff or whatever, but people are constantly coming in a, like, you know, on the office. Yep. You're like, right there, hey, right? Hey, Ken, like shot, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Like, right. you know, what is, what is Ben doing? You know, like, yeah. Um, and so you're constantly being interrupted. Whereas this, like that, all those questions come through it through chat now. So, you know, I can kind of control it's okay. Finish my thing then go answer that. Like, so for me, like the, this has actually been kind of great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and I can, I'm like right here in my studio. So if I, you know, if I have some time, I can, you know, or lunch, I can just like, yeah. Over paint and I, you know, like it's, it's for me, it's been really nice I, on some level. I mean, not to diminish and i you know i'm super grateful like we're really lucky i've had a job right right. several jobs i've had you know the the art side of things plus my you know like um so i'm not unaware that my circumstances are somewhat golden yeah um, yeah compared to like the experience of other people or you know sort of frontline workers and um, oh right not to diminish any of that but i i just you know working from home suits me is all i'm saying basically yeah no i I hear you when uh i had a hard time adjusting as well but um it's so funny too because a lot of people decided how important different meetings were like suddenly it wasn't like oh we'll just throw a meeting on the calendar it's it sort of became something where uh meetings if we were meeting it was a little more important than it used to be back in the day when it was a lot more casual we had the conference room, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I did dig it, uh, quite a bit and it it does, and it does add to that. You don't have to commute. You don't have to worry about other things. You just felt like you had more, more hours in the day and more productive hours in the day. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, like, you know, I finish up at five 30 or whatever. And then I can, I just walk upstairs and say, hi to the girls, you know, like, um, whereas, you know, uh, before you know i'm commuting for an hour and a half like so i'm not getting home till seven and then you know barely see my daughter before she's gone to bed and yeah so um as a father of daughters what do you think of the handmaid's tale uh well i mean yeah uh well i mean it's frightening but it it just encapsulates all the fears i have (laughs) you know like um essentially like uh that's really it you know like i'm just hyper aware that my you know my precious little girl is going into a world that's you know um not particularly kind kind yeah Yeah. Uh, you know i you know aggressively aggressively like against her on some levels like or at least portions of it you know like you know when i read it i think um i'm glad i read it as a dad as a as a husband and when when i read the part where um Alfred's uh, credit card and job are just taken away in a blink. And she turns to her husband to talk about it. And he's sort of, he, he, he's trying to calm her down, I guess, but he's very dismissive. He goes, oh, we'll be fine. And when I read that, I was like, I cringed. I'm like, oh man, your, your wife's agency was just completely taken away and you're going to come back with it's fine. And I love that because A lot of times I think, you know, husbands don't take wives seriously. And um, I think that's been something that uh, Margaret Atwood probably put in there as sort of a a hint, like a nudge. Let's all be more considerate of what other people are going through and whether or not your livelihood was cut off, because that that is the theme throughout this whole thing. women are in the crosshair they're they're getting the brunt of the oppression but the but all of society is getting smashed by this oppressive government so you know as a father of sons and a father of a a, i have a daughter as well uh i i just think and when i read that i think yeah it can't happen here well, you no, know, but that's the like that's the thing, and like that's for me, like that's what's so. I mean, you know, you talk about eighty-five versus now, like that's like just watching what's happening, not just in the states in terms of Trumpism, mm-hmm. but you see the right wing, the rise of right wing in Europe, and you know, even here in Canada, we've got some crazy right wing folk. Um, you know, we're not uh, we're not all saints up here, um, and 
yeah, you just watch that stuff and it's like, you know, like, I remember actually I had a moment like this was, I mean, quite a while ago, like maybe eight years ago or something. We had a, a scenario happen where I forget exactly what had happened, but there was essentially like um, gas production was affected, but there had been a refinery fire or something. And so there was like a month worth, a month where it was hard to get gas in Toronto, mm -hmm. where I was living at the time. And, you know, people lining up, having to line up and ration and like seeing fist fights break out in these lineups, you know, and yep. I'm sort of sitting there going like, you know, like, it's not that far a drop to get from where we are to what just energy, no. you know, like, um, and that's, you know, sort of like, yeah, like, you know, and I, when I read it, I was thinking of Afghanistan. And I thought, and um, again, I, I should have looked up her name. There was a, there was a, a, a young girl who wanted an education and instead she got mm -hmm. shot in the head. Yeah. And she went on, I think she went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize and she became a lecturer all over the world and a real hero. And uh, that was during the reign of the Taliban. And then I'm not saying what happened in between then and now was golden. It certainly wasn't. But then I think of where Afghanistan is now again. And, yeah. you know, it's like, these are very real things that are happening all over the world. And you're right. We are one gas line away from, from some real, you know, when people have to start worrying about, or think when, when people think they have to think about survival, let's put it that way. Like there may not be any real danger, but if the panic takes root, um, yeah. So um yeah no exactly so yeah i mean you know sort of yeah back to your question it just yeah it makes it makes that really resonate for me and my daughter like and her you know she's 11 well she's about to turn 12 um, mm. you know it's just sort of like god what's the world gonna be like when she gets you know out of here and even just stuff like you know like will she even be able to afford to rent an apartment oh yeah that's a whole other right you know, or a house like that to me is seeming more and more like that's just there's going to be a whole generation coming up soon or just home ownership is just not going to be a possibility yeah yeah i we're, we're i i see that all the time here too um but i don't know uh <laughs> uh you know it's i guess when you talk about a dystopian future novel uh you're gonna have these sorts of feelings but um i i would and, and, and when I talked to, uh, I talked to Sophie McIntosh who, who wrote the introduction and I talked to um, Jan Castro who wrote the afterword and both said, we would love to believe that this is a book we can look back on and say, what a great story. Thank goodness, nothing like that ever happened and we can go about our day. But, um, but yeah, that there's, there's like, you know, <laughs> this is not to make light of it, but they said, the chances of getting killed by a cow are slim, but they're never zero. So you, you have that little bit of fear, like, gosh, maybe, maybe. Yeah, well, well, I mean, but even again, you know, like what's going on in Texas, right? Well, not right now, but like right, you know, right. last month, and you know, like with the abortion right issue mm -hmm. and Roe v. and Wade being kind of put in jeopardy. You know, by, it's, you know, it's you know, interesting. interesting. So I'm talking to you, a Canadian, and I talked to Sophie McIntosh, who's uh, a Brit. She's she's in London. Yeah. And both of you cited that. And I thought that's so interesting because, you know, this is America. This is like it's a separate country. But the impact and, and that, again, that spider web, that global web, yeah. like that, that way you could feel the the little little wiggles of the net. Um, that's interesting to me. I, I just as a as a side. Yeah, well, I mean. Like, I mean, because for a long time, your country was a forerunner in all that stuff, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, and so to see that backslide is a bit scary, um, you know, from an outside perspective. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess I, I guess I, I just have this optimism that it could, you know, the only thing that I think would make a backslide as far as where people are now in real danger is if there's a total collapse like that's the only thing i could imagine i couldn't imagine us legislating the way to sort of this dystopia 
And because it really doesn't serve anyone. I, it doesn't, it doesn't well, further I mean, well, anything. But it, I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, I just wouldn't have imagined. Like, I remember, oh, what was it, like six months before Trump was elected. Um, project I was working on, some of the execs were up for a meeting. We were going out to lunch. We were talking about, oh, that Trump guy, he's crazy. He'll never get in. And then lo and behold, six months later, you know, like, oh my God, like they elected him. Um, yeah, you know, that sort of shakes your belief in. <laughs> like, so then, you know, and then you just sort of watch what's been happening for the last five years since that, you know, and this sort of like just this kind of eroding of things. And, you know, I mean, and it's hard to tell, but it's sort of like, you know, from my perspective up here watching it, it's sort of like, oh, you know, they might elect him again. You know, it's, you know, I, I can't, I, I'm trying to imagine what it must be like, because as an American and watching the, you know, the news media here and um, sort of getting a feel for the temperature in the room, exactly. I, I don't know what that must be like to feel like you're sitting right next to this volatile beast, like you're, <laughs> well, you're no, in but Canada. That's, no, but, that, but that's it exactly, right? And like, this has been like, I mean, I, it was funny, like I, I wrote an essay, like we, I had to do this uh, sort of essay at the end of grade 12, that was sort of like a big part of my mark. And I wrote it on the Canadian American cultural relationship. And mm -hmm. like, so this has always been a, a thing, like it's, you know, I mean, yeah, uh, for us, like, it, you know, there's this, uh, you know, America is just a huge driver of so many things. And we're like right next door and we're like yeah. this little brother kind of, you know, like, right. like um, or this little sibling that gets kind of knocked around by, you know, like uh, as much as we like to think we're, right, you know, th there's a, a tendency in Canadian culture to be kind of like, oh, we're not Americans and we don't, right. we don't, right. we don't have all that stuff. And it's like, no, we, we absolutely do have all that stuff. We're, you know, we've got racism. We've got all these things. Oh, like, sure. They're just not as like they're like on some levels. It uh, on some levels, I almost think that I mean because we before Trump happened, we had kind of like quite a long stretch of our conservative party being in power, and that that form of our conservative party was more right wing than previous versions had been. Mm -hmm. And sort of leading into the Trump stuff, there was certain things sort of coming up where you're just like oh my god that's you know uh i was again this sort of like little erosion of like uh things and and then that's sort of accelerated with trump and you just sort of yeah you um you're just left in this place of like where i don't i mean i guess i've traditionally always been optimistic too but i'm starting to maybe feel less optimistic well here's what i would say here's what i would offer as a thesis because the more each side plays this tug of war, the more likely that rope's going to break and those wings are going to fall off. And the vast majority of the human race is right in that center. I, I mean, yeah. And, and yeah, hopefully. Yeah. I mean, so that's what good. I think. I think uh, things, things sort of like it, we're going to, we're, we're going we're gonna to be like water. And I think we're going to find our own level. I just hope it doesn't have to get to something where, there's so much political division that people stop talking to each other and that yeah. is well and that's yeah i mean and that's what i see happening and like i mean and that i'm, I'm you know that's absolutely unfortunate because i mean it, it is that as much as you like you're in your you know like i'm on the left side of the spectrum and so it's like you know rah rah the left wing but like really really the productive of part of politics is when the left and the right talk to each other and they find like that middle place and yep. it's out of that that you know yep. the good stuff comes really right um yeah no so it's it's for sure I, I i definitely don't think uh this is a roadmap to where we're going but i, <laughs> God, I hope not <laughs> I, I i i definitely think this is a uh uh a flashing light on the horizon saying, you know, wow, uh, I, I couldn't help but compare it to the Holocaust and that, that, um, and I don't remember the phrase uh, or the saying of how it went, but it was some famous quote of when, when they came for the Jews, I didn't say anything because I wasn't Jewish. And then they came for 
this other group. And I didn't say anything because I wasn't, and it goes on until they come for you too. So yeah. um, yes, I'm, I'm not a woman and, and, but you can't sit idly by and, and, and read this book and not feel that human connection and that understanding that nobody wins if a totalitarian government does this. So, yeah. Um, well, and I mean, I, that's also, that's, but that's also what's brilliant about it, right? Like she's not right. being black and white about it. Right. There right. are women in the book who are like, you know, being absolutely atrocious to other women. Yes. You know, like, so it's like she's drawing all these really subtle, you know, uh, thing, oh, threads, you know, like. that. That is what I, I do love about it. It is, that is, is brilliant in that way. It is brilliant in the fact that, like just the, the one scene where uh, Fred's going off shopping and she sees the new guardian and he's got a little bit of fuzz on his lip and she's like, he's too young to know any better and he's probably suffering too. That little bit of understanding and, and, and the way she, she does that is, is, is brilliant um, mm -hmm. because it, it does demonstrate the systemic uh, reverberations. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I'm, I'm so glad I read this book um, and I, I'm so glad I got to talk to you. I saw your work um, and it, it's, it's so good. It, I mean, the, the, <laughs> The, the, the tone the spirit of it um i'm really excited to see have you seen the design the the finished product no i'm like i'm excited for tomorrow to see i mean i i there was a bit of back and forth about um one of the editions of potentially doing some stuff for the cover and uh, i mean they've landed in a really cool awesome place so i've seen like a little tiny bit but um yeah i'm i'm excited to see it because i haven't really i mean other than my work i'm not really completely clear on how it's all going to map out um um so i'm sorry uh, i i got a, a notification so how <clears throat> how long ago did you hand in final artwork because this seems like it's been uh, a short uh, timeline yeah I, I, it's been a while like um i think it was july i i i took four months on it like uh i mean oh. they they originally like gave me two i think and i asked for extra time just because i was quite busy um and they yeah they were totally cool to give it to me so but yeah i've i finished the artwork quite a quite a while back and, and what did you how, what was the medium you used to create the the art was it oil, uh or yeah it's mostly oil although like well i mean it's mixed like so i'll i mean a lot of the work on it i would start with a kind of a gouache pick out uh like so i you know do a drawing and then i lay gouache over top and then i like pick that out essentially with a brush like so I'm picking out the negative spaces and stuff uh, and and then I um, I wash over that with an acrylic medium and that messes up what I've done uh, <laughs> kind of intentionally like I get a some cool random texture out of it and it and then I work with that with the oil on top and I um, paint on top of that to get to the finished piece so when you don't have a consignment what do you what do you do like uh like what what how so you don't have a consignment it's after you're you're done directing for the day and you, you head over to your studio what what makes you decide what to do um i mean i always generally like are you talking with my work in general or these pieces or i guess uh, any will, like like not yeah. for sun top like the the pieces that you would someday maybe want to exhibit in a gallery yeah i mean i'm I generally, I mean, I start with a plan. So I'm I like a thumbnail, like I kind of do a traditional kind of process. Like I've learned in animation, and, mm -hmm. you know, the, like the way illustrators tend to work, like where I, I do like a, I just have a sketchbook. Like I, you know, I, I don't get to do it all the time, but like mornings before I start to work and definitely on the weekend, I, I just like do random thumbnails and sort of generate ideas. And then I, um, and then I start to pull reference together for that. Um, so I'll spend some time working in Photoshop where I sort of work up a composition uh, with my reference photographs are taken of model, the model, you know, people I'm having. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then, uh, and then I work out my composition in a drawn form. And then I get that onto, you know, whatever substrate I'm painting on. 
And then when I start to paint, I try and uh, that's where I try and introduce some randomness so that, you know, the way I'm laying the paint on generates uh, stuff that I hadn't had in mind. And then, wow. and then that gets me excited. And then that kind of carries the piece forward. That is so um, cool. So I work, I work with what the paint is doing. Like on some, like I don't try and totally control it. I like I try and control it to a certain extent, but I'm looking for those happy accidents. Wow. Partly because I mean, you know, in all honesty, like in my day job as a director, like in animation is a very on like it's a very very controlled process. I mean, I still have tried through my career to like figure out how you get some happy accidents within that, but but, <laughs> it's, but it's hard, you know, like yeah. I mean, that mostly just comes down to listening to your team leads and, you know, like, um, take, you know, uh, allowing my crew to have, like, like, to be like, hey, Ken, like, I've got this idea. What do you think? And yeah, I'm either, either like, yeah, that's super cool. Or no, that doesn't really fit within the tone of what I'm trying to do here. You know, like, right. um, but uh, I'm kind of looking in my painting to have a certain amount of surprise happen in the process. That's cool. That's that's really cool. Because I, I know I, I, I've heard a lot of authors say, and Stephen King has this quote, where he said, um, when you sit down to write a book, don't chase after your characters. What you do is you go into a field, you build a fire, and you sit and you wait. And then they come in out of the field, and they gather around the fire, and they tell you their story. Um, and, and what you described to me is, is very similar. It's, it's let the painting talk to you. Yeah. You're not sitting there demanding an image you're expressing an image yeah no i'm i'm trying to coax it out right yeah and, um you know that can be scary <laughs> right <laughs> yeah, especially sure. like in the context of like this you know like yeah oh God, i gotta deliver an illustration here or like you know right now i'm i'm doing monthly uh exhibits with wow times so wow gallery so like i've got to deliver a painting to them every month so it's sort of like you know um you know, on a timeline, it can be scary, that process, but uh, it's extremely rewarding. Um, and I, I feel like I get work, I get the work I'm interested in through that process. It's just, you go through a point where it's like, oh my God, what's going you're on? You're free falling a little bit, yeah. Yeah, and you're trying to like, you know, pull it together, but it always yeah. comes to the end, you know. Um, what are you doing with the originals from uh, this book? Um. I don't know yet. I mean, I might, maybe I'll put them on the market. Maybe I'll keep them. I mean, there's, uh, yeah, I mean, there's kind of an attachment that with mm -hmm. them that I don't necessarily, you know, uh, necessarily want to sell them. Yeah. Um, I guess, but. That's interesting. Maybe, yeah. What if Margaret Atwood wants to buy them? Well, we could talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not putting you on the spot. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I, I do I do definitely want to ask one last bit. Um, I don't know how you'll feel about this, but a lot of uh, if you've seen my other artist interviews, I did um, talk to each one about remarks. Are you familiar mm. with those? Yeah, yeah, I am. In fact, um, we're we just were talking over the last couple of days about that uh, with uh, Rebecca. Like, so we're gonna do um, for the lettered edition. Oh, we'll be doing that, but the, okay. not, the, not the numbered or the artist, um, but I'm, for them, I'm going to do uh, like images for like the, the lettered edition. That's awesome. Just little, just little sketches. That's um, so cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, but I mean, I, I've not ever, well, I mean, again, this is my first book. So I, like, I mean, aware of like, you know, how people buy the book and then reach out to the artist and right you know, have them I, I mean i would be open to that i think as long as it didn't become kind of like a a huge it's got to fit within my life uh you know I, I i've um for every artist i've talked to who's who's worked on a sun top book there the the reactions have been varying so there's some that are like yeah i'll do it but then they never get back to me and that's fine and i understand it's it's hard for me to put a number on art i i have a hard time doing it because Whatever you charge is what it's worth. And it's all such a personal interaction. So 
I'll probably follow up with you later on that. Um, if you are interested, obviously it would be closer to the day of release and people may will probably want to send you the book and then you would doodle directly in the book. And then send. so, <laughs> so there's a whole, whole process. We don't need to get into it now, but uh, yeah, yeah. the fans would be mad at me if I didn't at least raise it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, I'm yeah, I'm open as long as yeah, as long as it's not like a flood of. <laughs> I mean, it would then just become like, okay, we well, better wait. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you, you could totally set the limits. You could say, I'm only going to do 25, and the right, first yeah, 25 yeah. people that contacted you, that's it. Um, yeah. As limited edition collectors, we we understand rejection. We don't like it. We'll go to the social media <laughs> plane. But uh, but we get it. So, um, well, I, I totally appreciate you taking the time today to do this. It means a lot. I, this is a great conversation about uh, a Canadian honoring another Canadian. That's really the sum of it, right? That's yeah. Uh, <laughs> or well, being a fanboy. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, I, I can't wait to see because I haven't seen the final book. Um, Paul sent me the images of the artwork, and I thought they were stellar. And um, Thank you. I try not to look at them because I don't like to get those spoiler images as I'm reading the book, but I don't think there were. I think those images are still open interpretation. You don't really know what's going yeah, on. Yeah, I tried so. to not be like extremely didactic with what I yeah. was doing. Like. Yeah, no, but I, I think the mood and uh, it, it was so good. So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled you took the time today and, um, and just you know, I'll probably reach out about the remarks. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. You've got but until now. then, I, I wish you all the best of luck. Um, and it's been a treat. So, um, awesome, thanks. Yeah, it's great. Been great to talk to you. It's great. So, um, I will, I'll be in touch. But uh, yeah, I don't know how to end a conversation. So I don't know if that's clear. <laughs> I just don't. I, I don't understand. Yeah. I'm like, if I was a pilot. <laughs> Every plane would be like in Lake Michigan because I I just didn't know how to land it. Hey, we're all above, like you'd be. <laughs> <laughs> we're just gonna stay up here. Can you send a fuel jet? We just cannot land. Yeah, we, need, we need some beer. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, I, cool. I okay. I'm gonna end it now, though. Awesome. All right. <laughs> Take it. Bye. Easy. All right. Bye.